Hey, so I think we're live now. I think the Dark Lord runs the internet, so this is bound to have problems and glitches. <clears throat> I know there's a delay in the system, but um, so so I'm calling this Fridays with Fred. So obviously I'm Fred, and uh, it's really in this conversation it's going to be about homeschooling, homeschool community stuff, but also parenting. Um, I mean. I like to solve problems. You can see my newest book title back there. Enjoy your problems, uh, which should be coming out before too long. I'm, I'm a fan of learning to enjoy the challenges, but we uh, homeschooled our five kids ages. Uh, their range was nine years from the oldest to the younger. And uh, they're all grown now. They're in their twenties and early thirties. Uh, they're all college grads. We have 11 grandchildren, uh, or will in a month. <clears throat> we, um, have seen all the kids graduate college, get jobs, buy homes, get involved in their community churches. So a lot of fun, awesome, delightful stuff. Um, what, what, what I want to do is try to share with you. So, so we've written this book, um, the independent homeschool have courses, all kinds of stuff out there. But I wanted to have a live moment uh, for Q&A. You know, a lot of the questions are ones I've heard. Some there are things I haven't. Some we'll learn together. But I wanted this to be an opportunity for you uh, to certainly share with your friends, you know, click like and all that fun stuff. But, but specifically what we're aiming for is to um, advance the cause to kind of uh, get this thing in motion to help you grow um, as uh, a mom, dad, homeschool family uh, to educate your kids well, prepare them as we like to say, uh, the goal is to raise happy adults. Uh, if they're happy kids, that's a bonus, but we're trying to get them ready for adulthood. So, so the way this is going to work, I'm going to, I, I want to teach or mention some things kind of walk through a few thoughts and then um, uh, hopefully <clears throat> I know there's a delay in the system, but if you'll write comments uh, there or questions in particular, I uh, think I can answer them. That would be the, 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 the hope or, you know, give you my thoughts and uh, maybe some of the comments will have um, some help too. So we're going to learn how this goes, but uh, welcome to uh, uh, Fridays with Fred. And uh, I really, uh, really hope you find this helpful. So, so let me begin by sharing with you. Um, uh, there are three things I have down here I want to talk about. <clears throat> One is about human nature. So, so this is a big deal. And especially uh, having 11 grandchildren, I'm getting, I'm refreshed in all of this. So the oldest is six years old down to about to be born. And so in this game, I'm reminded as I interact with these uh, little kids um, uh, how human nature really works and how prone we are to miss that fact, to literally miss the idea of uh, issues related to, I'm trying to find, I apologize, engagement on Facebook group, my your audience. <clears throat> Yeah, I hope this is all working. So new comments should display. So if you have homeschool questions, add them. But let's talk about human nature. So, so if you don't understand this, you'll really miss out on how to parent well, how to develop your school, etc. Because if you if you think things work a certain way, um, then then you'll treat them in a certain way. For example, if you thought furniture could walk at night, you'd probably be prone to tie it down. Um, <clears throat> there are people who think furniture can get stolen at night, so they do tie it or chain it down, uh, you know, in the outdoor settings, uh, that kind of thing. But what you're wanting to really wrestle with with human nature is that uh, what's going on in these little creatures <clears throat> is probably not what you think. Pardon my voice, I'm allergic and catching on. So um, what 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 we tend to think is, they're going through phases. Um, you know, they have their own little unique 
uh, personalities. Um, they are um, uh, an emotional bundle and we need to really understand and help them embrace whatever's going on emotionally. Um, uh, life shouldn't be hard on them. And when they're stressed or panicked, obviously that's going to be a bad thing. Now, <clears throat> bear in mind, all of that can be true, but what's going on with children is much simpler than you think. And it works like this. They are engaged in learning. So, so what happens with a child is he or she is busy trying to figure out how the game works. So, so let's take language and then we'll get into like schooling behavior, et cetera. So with, with language, uh, what's going on with language? I like um, Chater and, and uh, their uh, orientation over Chomsky uh, and his, but basically their analogy is that language is, uh, is charades. That's what humans are doing. They're playing charades and we're pretty good at it. And then we learn the charades, learn the code, and then we can communicate. So if you were um, playing charades, you'd, you know, figure out something like um, um, uh, you could have a, a symbol for motor, but if you put a motor underwater, that would be a submarine on water would be a boat above water would be um, a car and above that high up would be airplane. So you're combining like motor and, um, you know, whatever the symbol for motor would be, if you had that and you develop a charades lingo or charades language, and you'd be really good at it. You know, if you want to, if you play charades a lot, I'll just practice, you know, getting a vocabulary down. Well, humans are the same way, except we're doing it with verbally with words and these words mean things, but it's a charades game. And if you think about it, think about your children and how they learn to talk. So, so what happens is they'll, <clears throat> they'll say stuff. We, I was doing it with my grandson this weekend. He was saying, um, um, Willie and, uh, 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 I, I like, I like that instead of that. And so I taught him, I said, look, you bite your tongue instead of, you know, that and he'd bite his tongue and go that. And it was great. We did another one with ours or something like that. So I gave him some feedback and he learns it. Well, it's also they're learning words. So they say milk, you know, or they, they, they say uh, banana and you hand them a banana and they go, no. And finally they go milk. And what's happening is there's a feedback loop going on where you're teaching them exactly how this game works. And they're learning that milk, the phrase milk means milk. And, and then they, then they learn like, like their accent. They sound like from the Northeast or from California or from Texas or from Alabama. And so all of these things are in a constant reward game and that's it. There's an internal drive in the child to want something. And then there's a game and the game is um, if you play right, uh, you win. And if you play wrong, you get penalized. And you can do it consciously or unconsciously. But the fact that you didn't give them milk is a penalty when they wanted it. So this is actually the game. It's called learning. And, and what's happening with any of these behaviors, whether it's doing their math or writing or uh, figuring out how to be obedient, uh, how to control their emotions, how to process things, anything like that, every bit of it uh, is a learning process for these kids. And so what is actually happening in uh, their life and yours can be addressed this way. Uh, when you see a behavior you don't like, look at your child and utter these magic words to yourself. How did I teach you to, and then fill in the blank. If they're given to um, having fits, you know, having tantrums, you need to ask, how did I teach you to have a tantrum? Because, I promise you, you've taught them how they're not endemic to children. We had five children. We didn't have tantrums. I mean, they got upset when they were young or something, but we'd let them go in their room and say, regroup. Um, we don't want to bother the whole family with this one. You got to learn to process your own emotions, your own stuff. Will we help them? Sure. If they need debriefing, et cetera. But honestly, uh, a lot of that was they would misbehave 
and they would freak out. And when they'd freak out, uh, if we run in and give them what they want, we just train them to be upset. So um, that's the game on human nature. And, and with human nature, fortunately, all this is coming through. So this is quite exciting. Uh, to see Q and A, and I'll get to them in a moment, as you can see them. So, <clears throat> understand that thing about learning that with any subject, topic, behavior pattern, etc., human beings are designed to learn. And what you're trying to do is set up the environment so they're encouraged to do what you want and discouraged to do the rest. That is the game. That's how it works, and it's going to work that way all through life, whether they're in jobs or school or. Um, married or whatever happens. <clears throat> so, so there's the first point. Um, what I'll do is, um, well, let me just mention these other two points real quick. So the, the second point I want to invite you to think about is the importance of process over goals. So a goal is great. Uh, but what I've found is that the plan is mightier than the goal. If you have a plan that won't take you where you want, it won't matter. And, and if you look at people like professional golfers, they want to win the masters, but that's not what they focus on. They focus on their process every day, hitting number of balls, chip shots, putting, uh, their conditioning, their exercise, their diet, whatever it is with homeschoolers, the more you can do that. That's why we have that 30 minute course. The more you can look at it as systematizing things and, and being engaged in the process, of just having a process. We, we, you know, we did an hour of writing, two hours of reading, two hours of math, day in and day out. And we focus on the process. If you focus on the process, eventually the process will produce what you want. Educated child or a good golfer, that kind of thing. The third thing I want to mention real quickly <clears throat> is about anxiety. I may come back to this. And if you have questions, that'd be helpful. Um, so uh, anxiety. Uh, it is very common for all humans to have anxiety, uh, but, but in particular moms, uh, and that's the majority group that homeschools. So it's not unique to them. It could be dads too, but, but they're worried. Jody was this way. She was worried about would our homeschooling work? Would they be able to get in college? Would they be educated? Would they, you know, be country bumpkins or something like that? I don't know what she was thinking, <clears throat> but in, in the due course of time, it got proved that what we did worked. And so she chillaxed, but she started chillaxing a little earlier because here, here's the trick with anxiety. The, the main thing you want to know is if you're anxious about something, it's about the future. It's something in the future and it's bad. That's how it goes. Like if it's good in the future and you think it might happen, that's called hope. But anxiety is thinking something in the future is fixing to be bad. Now, the reason you do that is because you think you're a prophet or a prophetess and you've got something in the future you figured out and you're just looking at one option, which means you got a lot of faith in that one option that you got it figured out. Life's not going to go well in this area. And so it generates anxiety. If you want that to calm down, uh, quit being a prophet or prophetess. And the easiest way to do it that I know there, I know a lot of ways, but one of the things I like to do is just to invite you to generate three options. Well, you already have one, so just two more. So like if you homeschool, um, they could get through and the children are not ready for college. Okay, that would be terrible or ready for life, right? Um, another possibility is it works magically well and they do great in life. Uh, another possibility is children, even if they aren't prepared, still are learners and they can catch up. Like if they haven't quite gotten what they needed to, there are remedial games in colleges, if that's the option, where they can go and catch up. Another possibility is you've got kids that don't want to do college anyway. They want to be tradespeople and do something else. So, so here's what I'm saying. Take the thing you're anxious about and try to think about a couple of more plausible things. I know you got the bad one if you're anxious, but there are a couple other plausible things and they could happen. And all you have to do is get fluent with the fact that those options are real and are possible. And when you do that, your anxiety by its nature has to calm down. All right. So I want your questions now. Those are the three basic things I want to hit on human nature, process goals, and anxiety. So glad you're here. Say hi, please. Uh, this is uh, 
quite fun and I'm going to figure out how to make this work all the better. Um, but uh, Carol throws at us, um, does your writing method course work for kids with dex dyslexia and dysgraphia or is more needed? And then it says for context, why can't I read? Huh. And for context, uh, I'm working on it. For context, my dyslexic, dysgraphic teen son has become a great reader. But writing is tough. Great. So, um, so oddly enough, our writing uh, course, um, the uh, feedback we've gotten, especially from dyslexics and any even on spectrum, people on spectrum, has been phenomenal. I mean, it's kind of shocking. I didn't even know for a while what was going on. <clears throat> but as I looked at it, I began to make sense of it. Now, dysgraphia is its own issue, okay? So that's a little bit different challenge and maybe typing works well or maybe practice, you know, with letters works well or maybe dictating uh, uh, to mom works well. I don't know. Uh, you know, it depends on what the game is. But <clears throat> with dyslexia and other learning type disabilities, what we found is that because the writing course is designed to learn to write by ear. So we're teaching them how to punctuate by how they want it to sound when read aloud. Uh, we teach them about um, how they aren't their uh, paper. They aren't their book. They aren't uh, it's the principle of separation. We, we teach them about language, how you can't really know what you're going to say before you say it and why it works that way. We teach them about correct writing versus, um, effective writing uh, type things. Um, we we uh, walk through a lot of stuff that is about mechanics and practice, but most of all, we're helping the child to get out of their head. So uh, our big premise is you want to teach a child to write, uh, okay, get help, and then make it great. That's the game. You write, okay, get help, make it great. And when they start practicing this and go through the exercises we give them, most children will catch on and get it out of their head. So what actually starts happening is they're not stressed. That's what shuts them down, that anxiety. It'll sound stupid. I won't do it right. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, dyslexia has always been described as smart, uh, but feeling dumb. Uh, Jody has dyslexia. And so this is something we've obviously worked with a long time. She has a master's degree in education. So don't, it doesn't stop anything. It's just a challenge about how things are processed. So um, it does work and it looks like it works specifically because it allows the child to get engaged in writing instead of thinking about writing. And most curriculum out there are busy about thinking about writing, getting it correct and doing it wrong and doing it right. And we're really focused on them finding their voice and learning to play with language so they can discover and learn how it really, uh, how it really works. So I hope that was uh, a fair answer. Let's see. I think Carol adds something. Um, get down here. Uh, he is taking your writing course now. Oh, and loves it so far. Well, that's fun to hear. It takes a lot of stress away and that's great. So there, that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, he's going to college in the fall and we are trying to somewhere. We're trying to uh, get him ready. Well, that's the thing to do. Have him write every day. Have him go through the course. After he's through the course, start writing every day. Give him feedback. Be sure and watch that um, video where I show with the red pen and the, and the green pen exactly how to give feedback so that he is getting a good feedback training so he can learn all the more about writing. But um, that's great that he loves him. Great that he's de-stressed. And that's the key. You know, it's weird anxiety, like if we solve our problems, we wouldn't be anxious, but because we're anxious, we can't really be creative. Like test anxiety, we lock up, we know it. And this is what the writing course is about. Well, all of our stuff is learning how to chillax a little bit so you can uh, really learn something. <clears throat> um, so let's see, is the writing course a monthly subscription? It is not. 
it's a, it's a lifetime game. Uh, partly the, the, the game with it is <clears throat> it really needs to be done in our experience about four or five times in the course of homeschooling. So around nine and then maybe again at 10 and then 12 and 14 and 16, something like that, maybe 18, because every time they go through it again, they will experience the course in a different way. The lessons are done. The exercises are open-ended. So they're going to be different each time. And, and just with anything, if you go through it multiple times, you know, you've grown since the last time you heard it. And so it's going to be a different course for your student when they're 10 or when they're 12 or when they're, I mean, you can do it every year if you wanted to, but the, you know, the way it's, it's done is, is that price allows it to be owned for life, you lose your computer or whatever else it's um, then multiple for the kids, but multiple times for everyone. And that's not going to be given to a subscription game very well. It's better to make sure you get it for life. So uh, yeah, thanks for saying hi. Uh, I don't know who sustainable motherhood is, but that sounds good. Um, let me see what else we got here. Thanks for going live. I'm very happy to do it. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to get used to how this works. So I've got to scroll down here and scroll up. I don't know why it's doing this. Um, if we ourselves are not well versed in the English grammar, how can we give feedback uh, to our kids? Oh goodness. I just helped the screen. So, so let's, uh, let's look at that one. If we ourselves are not well versed in English grammar, how can we give feedback to our kids, especially during the day? Uh, we have other kids to care for. Uh, so, <clears throat> so in, in the writing part, the, one of our premises, uh, if English is your second language or something, that could be a little different discussion. So let me just deal with most moms and dads that didn't study literature or grammar or something like that. Um, the reality is you already know grammar. In fact, Rudolf Flesch points out that grammar is the only subject you actually have to know before you study it. So in order to read a book on grammar, you already have to know grammar. It's in here. Our grammar's in here and linguists paid attention to how we spoke and made up rules to describe our grammar. That's what they do with all the language, all the translators, et cetera. So, so, so you actually know grammar intuitively. And so when, when I say to you, you know, um, Jimmy and me is going to uh, the swimming hole. Okay. So how's that sound? <clears throat> uh, if you're from Alabama where I was, that might've been okay, but I'm going to go, no. So it's not Jimmy and me, it's Jimmy and I, and it's not is going, it's are going. And we don't know exactly why, what the rules are, but we know it doesn't, it sounds better. And, and that in our training, we show you how to give feedback. And part of what we train you to do is to give that kind of feedback. Does this sound better? And they may not agree. Does this sound better or that? And usually if it sounds better, it is better. I'm going to just tell you, that's one of our lessons. If it sounds okay, it probably is okay. If it sounds great, I bet it is great. If it sounds better, I bet it is better because the grammar is already instinctively, intuitively built into the system because you've learned it. So that's how you do it. Um, and uh, my child really struggles with spelling long vowels. Uh, raid versus raid, paid versus paid. Do children really need to learn how to spell every word by rote? Are there tricks for this? Anxiety is around spelling. Well, I have an entirely unique approach to spelling that I'm convinced is right. I probably should write an academic article and throw it out there because I don't know how I stumbled over this. I just figured it out because I'm lazy. And it works like this. First of all, <clears throat> if you have common misspelled words, you know, if it just, if you're using paid for paid a lot, you do want to make a list of the commonly misspelled words, maybe 10 a week. Cause if you see them enough and they just practice them, they'll be fine. But, but here's the difference between a good speller and a poor speller. Uh, a good speller <clears throat> will not guess and a poor speller guesses. So Melody, I'm pretty sure um, your child, I could be wrong, 
it'd be the first time on, on this topic. Now I can be wrong about a lot of things, but um, your child probably is guessing and, and guessing is what makes us into bad spellers. The moment we quit guessing, uh, we're either going to do one of two things. We're going to look it up or learn it, remember it somehow, uh, or use a different word. I remember years ago as an adult and I kept looking at, I kept misspelling implement, I M P L and I do I M E N T implement instead of L E implement. And I finally said, like I do, I'll teach this in the memory course. Uh, I asked my brain, I said, how would you remember to spell this correctly? And my brain said, oh, it sounds like French, like le implement. So the L E le implement would always be the L E in the middle of the word. I never forgot it. Sorry. That may sound dumb, but work for me. Um, what we teach them to do when you get feedback, they write every day. And then what we would do is teach them, uh, have the kids mark words they weren't sure about. And I would spell it correctly. So I'd mark their word or they'd mark their word. I'd put an SP by it or circle and I would spell it correctly if it needed correction. Um, if they didn't mark a word uh, and, and I found a misspelling or Jody found a misspelling, they would then have to look it up. And so learn how to spell it, you know, go through that hassle. So at first they marked all of them basically. And that's fine too, because what I was trying to teach them is to tune in to not guess. You don't want to guess. You either know how to spell the word or you don't. If you're not sure how to spell it, don't count that as spelling. We're not guessing. Use a different word or look it up, right? Or in our program, we teach you how to give them that feedback loop. So that's the, I'd say that's the real key to uh, spelling. You want to train them over time to quit guessing. Whew. What else? I can tell you this, looking at our kids, I mean, <clears throat> my kids have written in total nine books, I think, in combination. Um, so I'm one ahead. Uh, <laughs> it's not a competition, but what I am fooling with is um, they got out and uh, wound up, two of them taught at the uh, reading center at the University of Texas in Austin or the writing center, not the reading center. And in the writing center, um, the kids told me, said, you know, basically what we've learned, especially because they're helping people with English as their second language, uh, foreign, you know, students that have come from overseas, et cetera. And so what they're, what they're doing, what they're actually doing, uh, they said is what you taught us. So we found that if we'd help them think about how it sounds, and start tuning into the sound of it instead of trying to remember the exact rules, everything changes just like we do with punctuation. When you teach a child uh, that a comma means pause and then they read it aloud with and without commas in it, you can just try that. Uh, it suddenly makes sense. You know, it's suddenly uh, uh, a great thing. I just posted a little thing a few days ago about this uh, um, Jane, um, enjoys cooking her family and her dog. It had no commas in it. Whereas if you put the commas in, Jane enjoys cooking her family and her dog. In fact, I say, if you can say comma and it fits, it probably below a uh, comma belongs there. Jane enjoys cooking comma her family comma and her dog. So there's uh, you know, there's part of the game uh, indeed. Um, this is great. I love your methods because they're focused on taking stress out of learning. Yeah. And, and, and not only stress out of learning, but really returning excitement because you know, learning is a dopamine hit. It's a jazzer. When you make sense of something, you go, Oh, I get it. And so there's no reason that this isn't, uh, isn't happening. So it's both let's diminish the stress and then let's build the confidence because as Emerson said, the greater part of confidence is having done it before. And so the more we can get them to do it, the better they get. I can remember in high school, 500 word essay, uh, junior and junior, 
in high school. Oh, we're dying. The weekend's ruined. 500 words? I can write 500 words in, uh, I don't know, a few minutes, a couple minutes. Uh, but I've been doing it a long time. So it's a skill that we have to develop. And once you get there and you know, hey, I can write more words, it's magical. Of course, now with chat GPT, eh, you don't need anything. Just tell the computer what to write. Forget that. Um, I've recently started this with my seventh grader. Oops. Restarted this with my seventh grader. It works. Exclamation mark. Mine was a guesser for sure. Oh, talking about the uh, spelling. Excellent. We started having our kids write letters to friends. Yeah, that's super. And grandparents. Jody always liked to get the kids to write letters to grandparents, great grandparents. Um, guess for sure. Uh, we started having our kids write letters to friends. They love having pen pals and it's encouraging spelling. Perfect. Uh, Binky says, I bought your writing course many years ago for my older children to use. Have you made any changes to it? Do I need to repurchase it for my current child? I'm schooling. Uh, you would not need to repurchase it. You just need to let me know you're in the system somewhere and you own it. You bought it for life. That's the way we do it. What, what I, there, there have been some things added, but there are like a supplemental mini course on writing prompts, et cetera, and some other supplemental uh, lessons that go over the basic principles, some videos. So uh, yeah, there's some, there's certainly some additions to it. Uh, we pulled our son out of public school in fifth grade <clears throat> and just taking the stress away was what he needed. Yeah, that can be a certain issue. Uh, now he can learn anything he's interested in. Excellent. The whole goal. We're just helping him fine tune the basics for college. He loves learning now and knows way more about so many subjects than I do. I went and I went to a big fancy university. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Didn't we all, but yeah, once you learn to learn, I mean, look, our philosophy is our, our whole goal was to develop kids who could learn how to learn. And my orientation was, education is skill development, not knowledge development. The knowledge will come, but it's developing the skill. And, and let me just tell you, if you can read and write and do math, you're golden. That, that skill stack, as they call it, in combination. I mean, the math deals with uh, logic and it's the language of science. Uh, if you can read, which most people can't, uh, you can tap into the minds of all of history and communicate with people very effectively. And if you can write all the more because writing forces you to think clearer. So actually that process gets you to be far more articulate and far more effective in communication. Writing is our four kids weakness. So next year we'll be getting your writing program. Uh, great. Uh, why wait? You know, why not? start this summer. Uh, they probably need to keep their brains fresh with reading, writing, just get in motion. I mean, in our program, once you go through it, we just want them writing a page a day, you know, when they get older, more pages, but just a page every other line and get a little feedback. All of our kids got busy writing long stories just every day that add on to the story, add on to the story because we weren't big about uh, writing essays until 14. I have some literature out there about that until they get older. Um, so just having the fun of learning to write and put their stories on paper and getting their imagination to flare was, uh, was quite cool. <clears throat> yes. I, I don't like to take summers completely off. Um, you can, but you know, it was invented because, we're an agrarian society, go back, help the farm, whatever. Um, uh, when you're an adult, you don't take summers off from learning, do you? You know, and we found in homeschool that allowed us to chill out the pace. And so if we had breaks or other things to do, we weren't pushed. We also found this. When you take a break in math from the spring to the fall, um, that the you forget a lot. You really get out of practice on math pretty quickly. In fact, you'll notice math books commonly about a third, a fourth or a third of the math book. The next section is a repeat of the last book, largely because of this phenomenon, because 
they've just forgotten. Um, so, you know, you have your own life, you figure out how you want to, but we, <clears throat> we found continuing in the summers was smart there. We actually did six days a week. We did Saturdays as well. You know, how brutal, but um, you could get out of Saturday if you would. Seems like Saturday only had math. I think that's true. Only math on Saturday. So it kept them fresh and Sunday was off. But you get out of math if you'd go do a service project, like if you picked up trash on the road or helped out with uh, a ministry in town. So the way we did it. Um, so let's see. Uh, Kelly says, how do you handle a child who cannot acknowledge their mistakes? Ah, very defensive. I just love this question. The short cut is to get our emotions course and go through it with them so they can learn to run their emotions, run their brain, run their emotions. But, but the defensiveness is something to do with, um, you know, being in trouble, being wrong, probably uh, in the direction of a fixed mindset. Uh, we accidentally do it to our kids. I did <clears throat> by praising them too much and giving them the idea they can do everything perfect. Sometimes really bright kids, everything kind of comes easy. And so they're hard on themselves if they make mistakes. Um, Proverbs 12, three talks about if you can't receive correction, you're stupid. And I would argue, and it'll keep you stupid. So, so, so the trick, at, at least I'll say in the writing part is what we're looking at was we're trying to write something that's okay and get some help and just make it better. So trying to communicate that this isn't bad, this isn't a bad, good thing. It's a, it's a better, it's, it's emotion to get better. And especially when they learn not to identify with their own writing. What, what we found is this defensiveness tends to go away when, when you're playing this game, especially when like with the green pen you're marking, I really like this. And the red pen means uh, this might could be said a little better. So the feedback is more complete. Usually when kids are defensive, all they're hearing is the bad and defend themselves and something bad's going to happen. And so you're trying to play, with them to learn how to be open to making things better. That's the whole goal. And that's why you say, you strictly say, does this sound better if you do it this way? And if they say no, go on. What do you care? You know, just keep with it because in time they'll learn to feel much more safe. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that's the crux of defensiveness, but it's something they need to learn, you know, to, chill out on the perfection to work from. Okay. Get help, make it great. Everything's well, one of the phrases I taught when I taught high school and I found they still have around the high school all these years later is look, everything's hard before it's easy, but it's easy once you know how. So a defensive child probably doesn't understand yet that, yeah, this is hard. This is how it's going to go. Um, do you have a recommendation for a fast way to learn enough, math basics to be college ready. Our son is great in math, but he feels like he's bad at it. So he avoids it. <clears throat> His dysgraphia makes it hard. I'm sorry. I'm thinking while I'm watching this, his dysgraphia makes it hard to take notes while doing math. He tries to do it all in his head. Of course we let him use calculator, but he still avoids math probably due to bad memories from public school. Yeah. So great question. Um, I'm going to quote Emerson again. The greater part of courage, courage is having done it before, right? The greater part of courage is having done it before. So he needs to build confidence. He's not going to do it with a calculator and he's not going to do it in, in his head. You've got to show your work. That way you can find out where the problem was. What, what I would do <clears throat> is I would go back in his books. I mean, if you were my son, I would go, and I've done this with a lot of people. I'd go back in the book and I'd find, uh, I, I don't know where we're talking about. So I'd go back algebra two, go back algebra one, whatever it is, and find an area where he can pretty much do the problems. 
And then I'd go a little further until I find out where it's sort of a struggle. And I kind of begin there maybe just before it. So we're building on his confidence, but what's got to be done. You got to do some problems every day and you've got to show your work and you got to do it on paper. Uh, don't want a calculator because we want him to understand it. And, and look, here's the trick. You, you want him to really get a hundred on the number of problems. You want to figure out how many problems can he do? And I'll say an hour for starters. Okay. And, and maintain about a 90% or better. And, and if he gets like a 50%, no big deal. Do the exact same set of problems the next day and he'll get better. He should. And if you have to do it a third day, do it a third day and then keep repeating that so that he really can learn that thing. When I studied Hebrew, the first assignment we had is we had to write the Hebrew alphabet 8,000 times or something. Why? Because they had a drum in our head because it doesn't look like anything. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Daleth, all these things. You just have to learn it. Math's the same way. You're going to get confident once you can do it. But to do it, you got to do it. So <laughs> that's just the way it works. But that's, that's the game plan. And so every day I just say, how many problems can you reasonably get done? And your mistakes in math are always going to be either you don't understand it or they're careless. So you need to be careful with that. Count those careless ones. And uh, if they don't understand it, they need to go back and read the section and figure it out because that's how you build that confidence and knowledge in math. So, what else? We got 15, set aside an hour for this. And I know there's a delay in my system. You probably type something. I don't see it. But you look, questions about, you know, I talked about human nature, process, goals, anxiety a little bit. We talked about writing. I like all these subjects, math, parenting, uh, anything that uh, is uh, in your mind or you struggle with, we can sure think about it uh, together. I will say, I will say this, if you just stay with it, you know, just like golf, just keep practicing putting, get a process down, just get better. Just keep practicing the math, keep practicing writing. Uh, the reading, I, I haven't mentioned this, but I, I think it's really important for the kids daily to debrief the reading to you, sort of a Charlotte Mason type thing. So what that means is get them to you or to each other when they got older. Um, tell a summary of what they read. You know, she was doing this, this happened, this happened, this happened. It's going to be some pieces and some story and they can share it. So that creates a feedback loop where they're articulating it and they know it's coming. So they're accountable. So they're going to read a little more careful and uh, you can do it at dinner. You can do it wherever you want to, but it works. I think, well, I think it's important. Um, I mean, if you can take tests, you can do that too, but even just that amount of feedback where they narrate or tell back what they basically read that day is, uh, is an important, important thing. <clears throat> do I have a reading list for a fifth grader? So we used um, the Robinson curriculum. There's a parallel one out there. We used it and then we substitute things in. Um, I, um, I don't have anything exactly that way. So we kind of through the curriculum would start kids where they were. And sometimes the better readers were reading things like reading Shakespeare way too early. And so they had to go back and read it again later. I do like um, <clears throat> Hirsch's series on uh, what each grade needs to know. So what a fifth grader, fourth grader, kindergartner needs to know, E.D. Hirsch. Um, so it gives you some cultural language. I assume they've updated it. But, um, you know, basically uh, anything that is reading age appropriate, but you never know because kids develop at different stages. You know, their reading skills vary. So I'd say you want to monitor that as well. I mean, you can get that list from, Robinson, there are all kinds of lists out there. There's another A plus. I mean, you'd look for these things um, or, or post it, you know, on the website and people will uh, let you know what, you know, they use. But in, in going through any kind of list, you're still going to have to pace it uh, for the child's reading skill, you know? So 
if it's too advanced, it's too advanced. I mean, I read the call of the wild in fifth grade five times. I, maybe it was fifth and sixth, but <clears throat> guarantee you, I learned a lot by reading a book over and over. I just liked it. And so uh, there was language mastery and all kinds of things. A lot of times we rush ahead instead of slowing down a little bit, because that's really what you're aiming for. You want them to get educated and that's skill development. And sometimes skill development goes slower. You know, the engineers that struggle more in college are better engineers because they really have to learn the math. The real smart ones kind of blaze past it. Eh, I mean, computers help them out, et cetera, but they don't know it in the same way. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah, debriefing will help your son's reading comprehension. It's a, it's a big deal. And you might want to look up um, Charlotte Mason and, and the idea of narration. This is what we do with the kids when they're younger. We read, Jody in particular, <clears throat> would read for like 10 minutes and then stop and call on one of them to basically tell back the story. So you're constantly learning how to do it. Our reading comprehension um, training is pretty unique in showing you how the elements and uh, the relationships fit things together and then how to move through time. So we're really teaching kids how to really look at a story and understand the logic of it before they're really developed well on logical ability. So you might want to check that out if, um, if you're interested, you know, the, we, we've changed to a subscription model for all those. So it's nine ninety five a month, uh, quit any time, but all, all those things are included. The emotions course and the reading comprehension course, a problem solving course, for the math stuff, I'd go through that problem solving course because that's sort of the same game for sure. Uh, what a grader needs to know, what publication year should we look into? The latest one, a grader. <clears throat> I do not know. Um, you know, publication years, I'm not sure what the nature of the question you might want to shoot it back. I just don't know how to interpret that, but um, <clears throat> it's, it's really odd. You know, I personally find that I am more challenged and more touched by people that wrote 150 years or more ago than a lot of current people. No offense on them. I like current people, but <clears throat> these publication updates sometimes they're upgrading and they're really downgrading. And so that's always a uh, part of a challenge of, of what you're trying to uh, wrestle with uh, in language. Uh, you know, the Bible translations to me have gotten a little sloppier. So I kind of went back to the new American standard because it's, it's one of the ones the new King James says it to the King James and largely the ESV. Uh, it's a word to word correspondence. So they're not making decisions for me. Others are easier to read. And I read them too. new living and a B or whatever. Um, but they're making decisions for me and I'm wanting to, I really want to wrestle a little more. If I can say it that way. Uh, the series you mentioned first grader. Um, yeah. Needs to know. So let me see if I can find that. I got you. <clears throat> Um, E.D. Hirsch, E.D. Hirsch, cultural literacy, literacy, excuse me, what every American needs to know. So that's the big one, but I want the littler ones. Um, I'm working on it. E.D. Hirsch. Spell it right. Uh, or, um, yeah, so yeah, here's an example. Um, uh, these, some of these look expensive. I'm sure if you look around, <clears throat> you can find a different way or your library may have a, a copy of it. Um, I'll just give this example just so it's in the uh, 
in the chat. So let's see if this gives to y'all. That'll give you a link to the Amazon book and that it's a series for each of the grades. You can find it from there. Let's see reading comprehension course. What age range is it aimed for? Is it meant to be listened to independently? It, it is meant to be listened to independently. There's some exercises that go with it. So you, it's probably good if you can just see what they're doing uh, in the practice stuff, make sure they're kind of doing it. Um, but what age? Um, so reading comprehension. So they need to be able to read, uh, which in my experience, you know, by the time a third grade, a nine year old that's pretty sharp, uh, is going to be fine. Um, 11, 12 is probably the right. And then up is probably the right range. Um, uh, nine or 10 will do okay. It won't be the same. You know, once you get into fifth grade, sixth grade, that's when, you know, the reading is starting to really intensify and you've added some years to it. Yeah, there you go. What's your fourth needs to go. <clears throat> Grades one to six. There you go. Thank you, GM, for putting that in there. Um, yeah, so uh, it can be done independently, but uh, that's the answer. It's, uh, it's you know, you, you have to figure things for your own kids. And again, you know, the way we like to do things uh, with any course or anything, when you're listening to something, you hear something that sparks some thought and you go off and think about it. And then by the time you come back, it's already skipped some stuff. So that's why the next time through, not only have you grown, you know, to match it, but you're also in that exact same process game, et cetera, where they are um, reviewing, but introducing new stuff, even though it's material you've heard before because of the nature of how humans focus and learn. So going through any program a number of times makes it way better, way better than one time through. All right. Any last questions? <laughs> My goal is to do this for eight weeks. We'll do it at the same time. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be available on YouTube. Uh, I'm trying to use this uh, restream technology. So I hope it works out. <clears throat> Let's see. My son is about to enter high school and I'm wondering how uh, it jumped. I'm sorry. My son is about to enter high school and I'm wondering how far to take writing. He wants to go into engineering and I want him to be proficient. Um, Yeah, I, you know, I don't know, I, I guess, um, you know, we have an essay course too. And for college, you want to master the essay course. So I'd take them uh, that far. It's pretty simple formula, a little repeat of some writing material, but here's the trick to essays. And that's what I would, I'd take him, I'd have him write every day until he goes to college just to continue to reinforce it. Uh, and, and it'll be a great advantage for him in engineering because they're not notorious for great writing. Um, but with essay writing, here's the trick. What you want to do is work on an essay over weeks. It's going to take some time and you want to just keep redoing it and improving it with illustrations in it and the right five paragraph structure, et cetera, et cetera, to where they get a perfect essay, not perfect, perfect, but plenty good. You know, like, Oh, the wedding was perfect. That kind of perfect. Oh, it's a perfect essay. So you, you get that essay really done over and over and, and you got to let them know that's what we're doing. So, so that they really know what a good essay looks like. Once they know they can do one and what it looks like, they'll be golden. Two of our children had their uh, freshman professors come to them after the first essay and said, can I copy this and distribute it to the class? Because this is what we want it to look like. So I would say that's something you're aiming for. Um, Hey, Carol, thank you. I'm glad this has been great. Uh, Melody, there's a book called ABCs and all their tricks. It might be helpful. Sounds good. Taught spelling, but consistent long-term copy work alone has done that for me. I agree. 
And then Rena, thank you for sharing your time. You're so welcome. What are your recommendations for testing learning disabilities, specifically dysgraphia and NVLD? You know, I, I'm not a specialist on that. We did get one of our kids tested uh, at a learning center. Um, I think you're just going to want to um, follow what's called the wisdom of crowds. So you ask your friends and other people and try to find out in your area um, who's doing a good job of, of helping with that. So it might be a government group or it might be a school or nearby college or could be anything. But uh, I would I would use that principle and search unique to the area. Uh, what would be helpful? So. That's uh, that's the game. All right. I uh, have had really a delightful time. We'll do it again next Friday. Tell your friends if you subscribe in YouTube. I think they send out notifications if you mention it to them. We'll try to keep uh, people in touch. And uh, if the video is posted and you find it helpful, uh, put some comments and share it with your friends. Anyway, it's been great. Hope you all have an incredible, incredible weekend. God bless.